First of all is the folder that's got some practice images. This is what you're going to use today to start thinking about how to do image analysis. So for those of you who have your laptops, you're going to be downloading those images onto your laptops. For those of you who don't, you will be downloading your images onto the computers here on the side. And feel free to down to work with them at home to sort of again get sort of feel of how to use ImageJ. It is not an intuitive program. It's actually kind of a pain in the butt to learn how to use. But once you've got it down, it's a skill that you're going to have for life, and it's actually really, really useful. Okay. There's also a video here on how awesome zebrafish truly are, and we're going to watch that as an introduction to the model organism. We won't be really using Blackboard for much else except for grades. I will post your grades for your worksheets as we sort of go along. So you should have some idea of how you're doing in the class. Unless you don't show up, you should do well. Because um, we'll be doing everything pretty much together, especially towards, you know, towards this, the middle of the course. So when most of your grade will be in. Let's start with this video. And then I'll give you my spiel. Oh. Now cover your ears because now I might get too loud. You can get better data, spend pennies on the dollar, and get results in a fraction of the time. Can you guys see it? Mm -hmm. Healthcare spending is out of control. What if we could get better data, spend pennies on the dollar, and get results in a fraction of the time? minnows you can buy at any aquarium store for a few bucks. Turns out, not only is the zebrafish immune system remarkably similar to ours, the human species and zebrafish share 70% of the same genes, and 84% of our genes known to be associated with human genetic disease have a zebrafish counterpart. Every organ system that we have will be modeled on zebrafish. Zebrafish will have the same sort of cells, have genes that have the same defects, respond to drugs in a similar way. It really sits among all the model systems at an incredible sweet spot where you're able to manipulate embryos very readily and you're also able to look at genetics and be able to study how organs will form and how they function directly. It's quite a remarkable organism. Zebrafish have over 26,000 protein coding genes. That's the largest gene set of any vertebrate sequence to date. Yes, sometimes we forget fish are vertebrates. They have a spinal cord. They also have a brain, blood, microbiome, muscles, intestines, pancreas, liver, kidneys, a heart, and a gallbladder. You can't study gallbladder disorders with rats. Rats don't have gallbladders. Zebrafish do. We have learned amazing things about organ development from the zebrafish. We also have found new genes that cause human disease, and we found new therapies that can be used to treat patients with disease. Zebrafish have become instrumental in so many fields of research, such as cancer, diabetes, addiction, Alzheimer's, and heart disease. Not to mention, zebrafish have emerged as a game changer for drug discovery. We can take a human tumor specimen, we can implant it in a thousand zebrafish embryos, and within five days we'll have readouts of, for example, drug sensitivity or metastasis. We have the potential to basically investigate that before treatment commences or shortly after treatment commences in a human. 
I mainly work with the cancer metastasis and invasion. Metastasis invasion is usually a, a long process. Then in mice, let's say for invasive cells, you have to wait for a month for that to happen. In zebrafish, you can get your data within 24 to 48 hours. Rats and mice are solid mammalian models of disease. But practically speaking, zebrafish have some stunning advantages. Zebrafish maintenance costs are less than one one thousand compared to mice. The low cost of zebrafish is a big factor. Um, we're able to maintain literally hundreds of different lines um, in my laboratory. Zebrafish are small and social. Your typical lab fish tank houses 70 zebrafish at a cost of about 6.5 cents a day for the whole tank. Your typical mouse cage holds five mice at a cost of about 90 cents a day. That's what makes it different from, say, a mouse model, because you can only do five mice or ten mice in an experiment, and it's very costly and it takes a long time. Zebrafish is a quick model and it's a very inexpensive model. Additionally, gaining access to mouse embryos during the gestation process requires surgery and increased costs. The mother is usually sacrificed, and the embryos don't survive long outside the mother. A zebrafish lays about 200 self-sustaining transparent eggs per week, averaging nearly 9,000 offspring in her lifetime. The mouse, five to 10 pups per litter, for a lifetime total of 300 offspring. You can see them at the one cell stage. You can manipulate them. We can increase gene expression. We can knock out genes. And then we can watch that embryo develop. And that transparency also allows you to non-invasively observe their organ development and biological processes in a whole living, breathing, intact animal as opposed to only slices of tissue under a microscope. The great power of zebrafish is, for my laboratory is the ability to really peer into the brain. It's almost like doing an MRI scan in a human where you can see different parts of the brain flashing. And we can actually artificially go in and control how neurons fire. So we can get a very good sense of how the brain interacts and controls behaviors. Zebrafish make estrogen. They also make all the major neurotransmitters, like serotonin and glutamate, which is why zebrafish have become instrumental for studying brain and chemical neurotoxicity, including how environmental toxins impact reproductive health, the health of our children, and our children's children. The community of toxicologists use zebrafish routinely uh, for screening of, of new chemicals and has led to a huge amount of uh, insight into human embryogenesis and birth defects. Generating transgenic or knockout zebrafish lines requires a simple DNA or RNA injection and for testing drug efficacy, just put them in the water. So we can actually take embryonic zebrafish, we can immerse them in a drug, and we can see how does that affect the development of the brain. We can obviously do this on an enormous scale. It's possible to test thousands of drugs in this way. According to the National Institutes of Health's Intramural Research Program, the timing of the adoption of zebrafish as an emerging model organism could not be better, as mouse studies often fail to translate to humans. Zebrafish can suffer from addiction. They have the same opioid receptors as we do. They've also become a model organism for studying autism, epilepsy, and rare genetic diseases such as potter willi syndrome. And zebrafish can repair and regrow fully functioning organs such as their spinal cord, heart, kidney, and retina. Imagine the possibilities. One of the cool things about the zebrafish is that we can introduce genetic changes that are almost exactly the same as those that we know cause autism, but we can actually see the zebrafish brain develop in real time. We're studying rare diseases, generating zebrafish models of rare diseases, and it can help to increase our understanding of important diseases like obesity and Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease, and then help to identify novel treatment targets.
Because the physiology of zebrafish muscles is so similar to ours, they're being studied on the International Space Station to help us better understand the effects of gravity on muscle mass. But I'll keep the zebrafish look very happy. It's like science fiction, except that it's true. New approaches for treatments may be just on the horizon. Whenever I talk about it, people go, say, wow, this is a nice model to do. We would like to do that too. How difficult is it? Can we do it with you? So this is a kind of a low cost, high throughput way of determining if there are drugs that are worth carrying on to the next step. Um, to test if ultimately they may be able to benefit the human health as well. An increase in funding for zebrafish would accelerate the pace at which we learn about diseases and the speed that we could get new drugs on the market, at least in the pipeline, and then to patients who actually Who would have thought a little aquarium store fish could be the salvation of the human species? We have the technology. It's a Let's bit much. Get our <laughs> worth. There's something. While I am also excited about the fish, I don't know that I would call it the salvation of the human race, but. Uh, as you can see, it, zebrafish has emerged as a very powerful model organism, especially in the field of drug discovery, which is what this video was really trying to highlight, were the benefits of using zebrafish over mouse. In particular, notice they kept picking on the mouse. Um, and so hopefully you are convinced that this is a pretty good model organism to really learn and understand how it's used, especially because it's going to continue to pick up in speed in terms of how many labs start adopting this model organism for different studies. So as you move forward in your careers, you can expect that a lot of what you do in biology and in science as a whole is gonna be impacted by what was done in zebrafish. So this uh, picture, you're going to see pretty much every time you walk in here. I will provide it for you in your notebooks. Most students just sort of keep it in the front because you'll be looking at it a lot, okay? This is the zebrafish developmental time series, okay? So it really steps you through the different stages of development starting from the zygotic stage, which means this is the point where the, M the sperm has met the egg, sperm has penetrated the egg, and once this organism goes from being haploid sperm and egg to a diploid uh, organism, it's now a zygote. Okay, so that one cell stage is a zygote. You'll notice that going from zygote to fertilized, it undergoes a change it, immediately in terms of how it looks. It goes from looking like this gray ball that you can't see any differences in to having what looks like a little bubble at the top. That bubble is what becomes the fish. Okay, that's the one cell that keeps dividing, dividing, dividing to become the fish. Okay, so as you step through from fertilized to two cell, you see that that one cell became two. And you'll notice uh, when you look at them under the microscope that you can very clearly see at those early, early stages of development, the individual cells, which is kind of neat. What I hope you also notice is that as you move through development in the early stages, the cells seem to pile up higher and higher. Okay, so as that one cell divides to two, which divides to four and eight and so on and so forth, those cells sort of stay on top of that giant yolk ball. That yolk ball contains all the nutrients that this organism needs in order to get them through development because obviously they can't eat, right? They don't have a mouth, they can't eat. They also don't have a placenta to provide oxygen and nutrients and vitamins and a lot of other stuff. So the yolk provides all of that. You'll also notice that there does come a point though in development where the cells are no longer piling up, but instead they look like they're spreading out around the yolk ball. And that's actually a very important transition in development. Uh, so in class yesterday, I mentioned the fact that we look in the class at the very early stages, so zygote to blastula to gastrula. Gastrula is the stage where the cells start to move around that yolk ball. 
And if you remember, I had told you that the gastrula stage is super important because that's when the three germ layers become established, okay? That time coincides with this uh, shield stage in embryonic development of the zebrafish. Okay, so it's a very important time point in zebrafish development. Another time point that I want to bring to your attention, mostly because it'll impact how you develop your projects, is this uh, high stage. So the high stage in the development of zebrafish is the point where the genome of the actual animal starts to transcribe its own material. Up until that point, all of this development that's happening has been because of all of the material that mom was able to stockpile in the yolk ball and also in that one egg, okay? When it reaches high stage though, there's a switch and transcription begins from the genome of this new organism, okay? Now the reason that that's gonna be important for you in developing your projects is that you're going to have to come to a decision later on on whether or not you wanna add your drug before or after that stage, right? If you add it before, you're impacting material that mom deposited into the egg. If you add it after, you're impacting the products that are made from the genome of the organism itself. Okay, so as you're reading through the literature and thinking about your teratogens, always keep in mind, do I want to be looking at what happens really early or do I want to be looking at what happens once the animal is able to transcribe its own genes? Okay. Okay, so when I was first coming up with this presentation, that video that I showed you hadn't come out yet, so some of that material is sort of uh, duplicated here, so I'm not gonna go through it a ton. Hopefully at this point you feel pretty confident and understand why we use zebrafish as a model organism in general. And hopefully you also understand why we're using zebrafish to study how environment impacts development, right? The uh, development happens externally, so outside you can get a lot of embryos out of one pair and you can put them into dishes, either in a large dish and treat everything all at one time, or you can get dishes where you have one embryo in every little well and look at what happens there. Uh, one of the biggest and most important things about this organism is that they're clear. So zebrafish don't develop quite that fast. Obviously this video is sped up so that you can see all the different stages. There's the gastrulation stage where you start to move around the yolk ball and almost almost looks like it eats it. <laughs> okay, that's the eye forming there at the top and the brain just under it. This is a zebrafish at approximately 12 hours after fertilization. So development is actually quite fast fish embryos, okay? So it's a pretty cool model organism to study early development. But the most important thing is that up to 24 hours, it's clear, like you can see through this guy, <laughs> okay? So it, it's a really, really powerful model organism for studying pretty much organ formation and anything else to do with early development. How fast cells divide, whether or not they die, so it can be pretty powerful. Uh, they're also used for genetic screens, which we will not be doing. We don't have time for that. Uh, one of my favorite applications is the idea of being able to inject them. So you can inject them with drugs, you can inject them with RNA, you can inject them with DNA, proteins, anything that you can think of injecting these guys with, you can inject them. Uh, you can inject either right into the yolk ball, or you can inject it directly into the cell. So unfortunately, we are not gonna be able to do that because we don't have the setup for it. Um, but as a model organism, just so you know, it is something that can be done. And again, that could be very powerful, especially if you wanna create genetic knockouts. So you would inject the proper RNA and protein into the cell and hopefully knock out the gene that you care to knock out to see its phenotypes. And it's actually a pretty uh, straightforward system as opposed to trying to do it into a mouse where you'd have to 
create this embryo to then implant it into a host mouse to then see the chimera. It's a mess. Bottom line, superficial. Cool. Okay. Okay. So now that everybody's convinced the zebrafish is cool, or at least you will be by the end, I want to talk to you a little bit about the environmental factors that we've looked at in the past here in the lab. Again, this list is not exhaustive. I'm open to other ideas, but just to give you a sense for what can be done. Um, one, one reason why we care about doing this kind of work is because we know the environment impacts human health, right? It, it impacts us as adults, but it also impacts embryos, right? Embryos and how they develop. And sometimes if the wrong environmental factor comes in contact with the embryo at just the right time, you get some major birth defects, okay? Just uh, in terms of some vocabulary. So when I talk about genetic factors, we're talking literally about the DNA, right? A DNA sequence has changed or the number of chromosomes in an organism has changed so for example someone who's got down syndrome has one extra chromosome 21 that they shouldn't have right that's a genetic defect stochastic factors are things that are random that you can't explain they're only stochastic because you can't explain it okay um those are considered sort of random events now the environment is anything external to the embryo okay um, in a human, this would be anything a mother ingests, inhales, or could otherwise end up in the bloodstream that might actually come in contact with the embryo. In a fish, of course, it's going to be anything in the water. Okay? Okay. This word you have to become very comfortable with. Teratogen. That's the word that we're going to use to describe any chemical that you're using that might cause a developmental defect. So just for some perspective, in a human, a teratogen would only come in contact with the embryo if it can cross the barrier, which is of course in the placenta, right? There's some exchange of oxygen and nutrients between the blood of the embryo versus the blood of the mother. There's supposed to be a lot of <laughs> barriers to things coming across between uh, the exchange of mom and, and embryo, but because the barrier is cellular, in other words, plasma membrane, anything that is permeable to the plasma membrane is going to cross from the blood of the mother into the embryo, okay? Um, again, in fish, it's a little bit different. You add the teratogen to the water, and how well the embryo picks up the teratogen is based on how well that chemical can get through the plasma membrane, okay? So there's a couple factors you got to take into account then. And they're all uh, organic chemistry related. The permeability is based on the size and charge and shape of your chemical. The flatter, the more hydrophobic it is, the easier it is to get across the plasma membrane, but it might also uh, clump up and, and precipitate out of solution. So these are factors that you're gonna have to sort of take into account as you develop your projects, depending on what your teratogen is. Okay, so just sort of keep that in the back of your mind. So this figure is from the textbook that's associated with the course. Uh, we're showing you sort of the embryonic period of the human, and it's showing you when each of the different organ systems are established during embryonic development. One of the coolest things, though, about this figure is these bars under what these bars represent is what point in embryonic development you might have a birth defect due to a teratogen, okay? So you'll notice that for almost all of them, anything before eight weeks could impact pretty much anything that's already been made. So a teratogen that sees an embryo in week three when the central nervous system is being developed could potentially harm the brain or central nervous system development, right? If you look at week four, if a teratogen is introduced, it might impact the development of the central nervous system or the heart. You may see some problems with development of the upper limbs and the eyes because that's the time when the cells are established to make all these different uh, body parts. 
as the embryo moves from being an embryo to being a fetus, you'll notice that there is less possibility uh, and less severity in potential birth defects, okay? My point in showing you this is to highlight the fact that if a teratogen comes in contact with an embryo very, very early in development, during organ formation, that's when you are most likely to see the worst birth defects, right? This also coincides with the time where the female doesn't likely know that she's pregnant, okay? So it's sort of powerful to know what the environmental factors are, but also the fact that your embryo may come into contact with teratogens before you even know that you're pregnant. So there's not a lot you can do in terms of prevention. But if we understand what the teratogens are and how they might impact development, then maybe we can find some way to mitigate those defects later, or even better, apply some policy that lessens or eradicates altogether the teratogen in our environment, right? That would be sort of the goal, the dream, okay? This book also has this really great table uh, where it's showing you the most well-studied teratogens, things that we know cause problems. Alcohol is probably the best known of all of them, right? We've heard of fetal alcohol syndrome. And then there's these, this list of different chemicals, but also ionizing radiation, hyperthermia, which is basically high fever or high temperatures. And that's what we're gonna test next week with our embryos. There are also some infectious microorganisms that we know cause birth defects. Notably not on this list because this book is old is what virus has been making the rounds? No? Hot. HPV. HPV has been a problem. Who's heard of Zika? My microcephaly, right? They keep showing these babies with these deformed heads, small heads. And that has been tied to Zika virus making its rounds. Um, and then some other more modern studies have looked at how the female metabolic system impacts development. So women who have diabetes and they have these giant babies, um, what is going on there? What is the outcome for that baby? So there's a lot of really cool work that has been done but still needs to be done. because There's still a lot we don't understand about how these teratogens, first of all, get in and how they impact development. So alcohol is one. As I said, there's this uh, whole spectrum of uh, phenotypes called fetal alcohol syndrome. This is an example, again, from that book I was telling you about. This is what a normal uh, child's brain should look like. And these different colors represent different neurons, different types of neurons. You'll notice that in a child that's got fetal alcohol syndrome, first of all, or this is a very severe case, I should mention. Uh, you'll notice that the brain isn't formed quite right, it doesn't look the same size, and it doesn't seem to be as well defined as normal. And hopefully you'll also notice that there are less neurons, okay, up top, and we don't know why there are less neurons. Okay, so this is just an example. Another reason people are interested in alcohol as an environmental factor and trying to understand how it impacts development is that it turns out that very early exposure of alcohol seems to lead to these brain deformities. Obviously, embryo is not gonna survive this, right? If you have an open brain, it's not gonna survive it. So what we don't understand is cellular aspects, like why alcohol causes Oh, and I should mention that there are a whole host of behavioral uh, phenotypes in folks who have been exposed to alcohol early on, so things like ADHD and hyperactivity. So a lot of work to be done there. Endocrine disruptors is another really common one that people think about because BPA has become so prevalent in our water and because we're exposed to it daily. <laughs> Right? Anybody who heats up Tupperware in a microwave, I know I'm guilty of that. You're ingesting some BPA whether you like it or not because that plastic leaches into your food from, uh, from the Tupperware. And so it turns out that those plastics that leach out from 
the Tupperware and get into your food, get into your water, they look a lot like estrogen. <laughs> so you're introducing compounds into your body that mimic estrogen. And it actually has been tied to low fertility, especially in males. Um, this weird thing where there's feminization of males over time. We've seen it in a lot of model organisms. It was first, I think, described in frogs. There was this pond where there happened to be a lot of BPA, and there were a lot of females or males that look and behave like females. And so we're, there's a lot of work trying to understand what it is about these endocrine disruptors early in development that cause these phenotypes. BPA is not the only endocrine disruptor that we know of. There are several others. These are just some examples. I, may, I mainly show this to try to drive home the importance of the chemical aspect of these guys. Notice that all of them have sort of a shape that would be more flat. Um, and it's those aromatic rings. So all these sort of ring structures that are really important for first of all, getting them through the plasma membrane but also binding to the estrogen receptors themselves. That's why they can function as endocrine disruptors. So it's, it's kind of an interesting biochemical problem as well. Lithium chloride, which I said is one that we will use as part of our experimentation in the class to try to learn some of these techniques. Lithium chloride has been used for a ton of different things. The most famous is of course depression. But it turns out it's been used for other things like treating mitochondrial abnormalities. That's a pretty new use for lithium chloride. Uh, ADHD and all these different disorders. But it's been a bit controversial because we know that lithium chloride can also cause problems in really important developmental pathways. Um, so it can lead to birth defects if it's used at the wrong time in development. So here's an example using the zebrafish. We're gonna we're going to actually try to replicate some of this uh, here. So hopefully you can see in panel A that's what a normal zebrafish embryo looks like at 24 hours. Depending on when lithium chloride was given to these embryos, it impacted what phenotype you got. But I hope that it is clear in B, C, and D, these guys are not okay, right? There are body parts missing. One thing you can't necessarily see from where you're sitting is that some body parts are duplicated where they shouldn't be. So this guy's got two spinal cords. He's a mess, okay? So lithium chloride can definitely cause some problems. So the question becomes, is there a dosage that is safe? to consume? And if there is, does it matter what time in development? And that's true for all the teratogens, okay? So those are just sort of some teratogens I wanted to highlight just to sort of get you in the mode and thinking about what we will be looking at this semester. Before we move forward, do you have any questions, comments? Nada. Okay, so we're gonna move on then because one of the most important things you have to do in this class is take pictures and be able to analyze them, right? Because you're gonna treat your fish, then you're going to document that data by microscopy and then you have to analyze it. We're gonna start today by learning how to take those pictures and start the analysis process. You're gonna start with images from a previous class just to sort of get you going. Since we only have three cameras, we have to sort of do this in shifts. I'm going to try to acquire more cameras before the semester is out. But for now, we will just all be good as well. So before we get started, we're actually all going to start with part B. Okay. So for part B, you notice that it's going to tell you that you are going to write yourself a protocol. So you're starting protocol writing today. You are going to write for yourself a guide on how to take pictures. 
I'm going to do a demonstration of how to take the pictures. I want you to come with me to the microscope, bring a notebook, pen or paper, and you're going to write down as much as you can of what I've said. And then I will, on the board, put sort of a schedule of you going to the microscopes that will be on the side to actually take the pictures yourselves so that you can edit your draft of your protocol because it's almost impossible to catch every little thing I say and every little thing I do. And sometimes for me, when something is really obvious, I won't say it, but for you, it may not be as obvious. It's going to depend on your skill level with my process. So you'll be writing yourself this guide. You will be using this protocol the entire semester, so you will get that. So that next week when you have to take a picture, you're not like, um, I don't want to use this microscope again. You don't want to waste your time trying to relearn something that you could have learned really well today. Okay? All right, so bring your notebooks over here, please. The dissecting microscopes that we have to work with are not at all fancy. They're ancient, but they really do a good job for the kind of work that we'll be doing. To take images with this thing, first of all, because we're not the only class using them, you're going to have to adjust it every time to whatever it is you're trying to look at. Okay? So I took a slide for myself just to sort of give you guys a demonstration of what you should be doing. This is going to be the camera that you'll probably be using the most. This is an Amstrol camera. In order to take a picture, you have to remove an eyepiece from your microscope and you have to install the camera right into the eyepiece. Unfortunately, we don't have a setup where like a tripod. Uh, next to every camera will be a box that has all of these little accessories. So you have to find the adapter that works best for whatever the eyepiece is. The biggest one. Does it matter whether you put it into the microphone? Yeah. Personal preference. So once you find the right adapter, you'll put the camera in. I'm going almost in reverse order though than what you want because you want to find your sample first. Okay, I'm doing this so that you can see what I'm doing. Okay, so keep in mind, you're going to want to put the camera in pretty much last. You want to find your sample first. And we're going to go through how to find your sample. And again, I'm only doing it this way so that everyone can see what I'm doing at the same time. Okay, so obviously the first thing you have to do is turn on the once you turn on the microscope, again, where uh, this piece of the microscope is, so let me just try and see if you can see. This thing can be adjusted to go lower or higher. Okay, so you may have to adjust for yourself depending on what you're looking for, how uh, far that working distance is going to be. Okay? So if you put the microscope really high up, you might be able to capture a bigger field, but you may not be able to get the detail that you're looking for, okay? So here is an example where I put the lens as high up as it will go. And I'm gonna put here a sample. I'm gonna try to capture its whole length. Okay, now. If I were just looking for length, this would be perfect, right? Because I'm capturing the entire length of this thing. If I wanted to just focus, though, on this one piece and I was looking for any real detail, the working distance is too far. Okay? If you come up and look a little closer, you'll notice that the image is actually kind of fuzzy. So it's not really going to give me a lot of structural detail. It's only going to be good for telling me how long this thing is. And if that's all you're looking for, then that's great. Take the picture and you're done. 
Okay, but if you're looking for better detail, uh, it's too far out, you're not going to be able to get the right um, magnitude, or not the right magnitude, the right, uh, the right resolution. Resolution is different, of course, from magnification. Magnification is how big this thing is, resolution is how well you can see the finest features. So when it's this high up, you'll get uh, the whole organism, depending on how big it is, but you're not going to get a lot of resolution in your image. Also, I want to mention that on these guys, the magnification is here on the side. Okay, right now this is at a 0.9 magnification, which is the lowest. So I can increase it, and you'll see, you'll see that now we can see a lot more. Right, structural features, so we can increase it more. That's this digestive tract, for example. In a much better detail. So again, you're going to have to sort of adjust all of this to whatever it is you're looking for. When you're working with your samples for your projects, you always want to start with your untreated or your normal, your control. Okay, because you're going to find all the right settings using your control, and then you're never going to touch your settings again. Because you want to take your images for all your treated samples using whatever you use for your control. I hope it's obvious why that would be, right? Because you don't want to really focus in on the human, on the uh, drug treated guys, and then it turns out that for the control, you have to use different settings, and then you can't compare them well, okay? So always start with your control. Okay. So let me zoom out here. So again, if you, for whatever reason, can't see what you need to see, you could try lowering. Make sure that when you tighten it back up, though, it's really tight so this thing doesn't fall on your sample. So that would be bad. Okay. Once you change the working distance, you're going to have to change uh, the fine tuning of it, okay, or the coarse tuning. So I hope you can see that now that I've changed the working distance, you can see even more structure. Right, so you're, you're increasing the resolution that the lower your working distance is. Okay. But again, if you're trying to see the entire organism, this may or may not work for you, depending on how big it is. In this case, we got lucky. Now, once you find the right settings, so the right working distance, the right magnification, the right resolution, then you can go ahead and, say, if I was doing this properly, I would be using this, I would be doing, finding all those things with my eyes, right? Okay. Once you find everything you need, you take out one eyepiece, you put in the adapter, you put in the camera, And then the program that you're going to use for this camera is called AMSCOPE, A-M-S-C-O-P-E. I have CDs. If you have your laptops with you and they have a CD drive and you wanted to install, uh, the, no problem. You can definitely do that. Okay? That way you have it on your laptop and you can take the images directly onto your laptop. So once you get into AMSCO, you're going to hit under camera list, MU1803, that's what this camera is, 1803, and when you hit it, it will give you a live view. Okay. Now what you'll notice when you look at this software uh, is that it has a lot of options. For the purpose of this course, we're going to keep it as simple as humanly possible, okay? I don't want you to be messing around too much with all the different options because it's just going to start getting super complicated. Okay? But one trick that I did want to show you, which is actually really useful, is that sometimes, and you'll see when you're working with your live zebrafish, especially the mobile ones, once you get them where you like them, you don't want to touch the slide too much, okay? Sometimes it's useful to just turn the camera. If you 
you want to change the orientation that you're taking your images. For the zebrafish, you will always be taking your images, or at least presenting them, in the anterior to posterior direction. In other words, the head will always be on the left to the person viewing it, and the tail will always be to the right. So, once you have it the way you like it, and this also includes uh, the brightness of it. So on the side here at the bottom, it, you can show how much light comes through. So depending on what you're looking at, sometimes a lot of light isn't advocated. You can lower the amount of light to see whatever it is you want to see. Especially if you decide to look at the eyes, sometimes sort of changing uh, how much light comes through is helpful. Okay. So once you have it, like I said, the way you like it, and you have the light settings for your control, you're never going to touch it again. Right? Every image you take will be just plug and play. You'll be taking out the control sample and putting in your Okay. To snap the image, I always use the lowest resolution. So if you sort of come a little closer, then you can see on the side here you have some options in terms of format and uh, your snap resolution. 4912 by 3684 is a high resolution image. If you're looking at something really fine, go ahead and take it. Most of what we do here is going to be sort of ultra structural, it's going to be big, so you don't need that level of resolution. Most of what we do is good at 1228 by 922. This will also limit your file sizes, so they're not going to be so huge. Okay? The higher the resolution, the bigger the file size. And especially on these computers, this becomes a problem because we're sharing these computers with other courses. We don't want to take up all the money. Okay. One thing I want to tell you about these, uh, this software, really any imaging software with cameras, is that you have the option of auto exposing, which means that it sets what it thinks your light should be for taking a good image. You don't ever want that because you want to be in total control of your light situation. So always make sure that that box, that box that says auto exposure is off. It doesn't have a check mark. Now, should you decide to get very uh, fancy and you want to change uh, the color because you're trying to see pigmentation, for example, there are some options for color adjustments. I would highly recommend, though, that once you find a setting that you like, you write down what that setting is for hue, saturation, brightness, etc. Because as you move from one sample to another, this guy might decide to go rogue and auto expose on. So you want to make sure that your settings are exactly right. Okay? And it won't necessarily see them. So make sure that you got them. Okay, so once you have everything you like, you will go ahead and snap your image. The snap button is just right there at the top. Snap it, and it's actually going to come up as a separate tab, and it'll have a number. In this case, 0001, because it's the first image taken. Okay? Now, once you have it, obviously you have to save it. So you go to File and Save As. It'll save as a TIFF. That's its automatic setting. You can change the format if you want to. TIFF happens to work uh, really great for me. The ImageJ software will also take JPEG pretty well. So I would stick to either TIFF or JPEG if you have a preference. Uh, and then in terms of how you name, today is not as important because this is just for practice. You will have a naming system, though, when we get to actually documenting your data. And I will give you that system later on. For today, we're just going to focus on snapping the images. So I'm just going to name my sample one.
If you use these computers, there's actually a BIO 323 folder, so save it onto that folder, please. <laughs> okay, so once you have your image and you say, hooray, I'm finished with my imaging, let me analyze it. Let me take you through really quickly the image JSON software, which is a whole other one of So image J, as I said, is not the most sophisticated or fancy, but it'll get the job done. This I actually can do on the projection of the In the image J program, what comes up is that really weird um, bar up top. It doesn't hardly even look like anything. <laughs> but to open your images, you'll hit file, and then of course you would open. I was already using this folder, but obviously find your folder where your picture is in. I'm going to use sample one, and it'll pop up your image. Okay. Now, let's say that what I cared to measure was its length. Okay. You'll, you will realize really, really quickly that sometimes it's a judgment call, <laughs> what you call the length. Okay. What is important is that you're consistent. Okay, so for example, if I wanted to measure the length of this guy, let's say that I said, okay, today I'm measuring the length from the very, very tip, the very anterior most part of this guy to the most posterior part. So I'm going to measure the whole thing, okay? And that means I have to do that every time, every sample from here to the end of time, okay? I can't decide tomorrow, you know what, I'm just going to go from this part after this antenna looking thing from here to the tail because when i did my drug treatment the part that was different was just this part you can't do that right you have to be consistent every time okay so in order to measure the length you want to pick um the shape that you want to use now because what i'm looking at is something linear I, a straight line is good enough for what i'm trying to find right so you hit the line, you bring your cursor over to where you want to start the measuring. Can you see the cursor from wherever you're at? Should I turn off the light? Would that be helpful? We're good? Okay. So you put the cursor to what you consider one end. You're going to press down on your mouse, and then you're going to drag all the way to the end. And again, you have to be consistent every time, okay? so. Even though this guy is sort of arched, I'm, I'm making the choice to just measure that straight line across from the tip to the tail. And then you just let go. You'll notice that the line is still there, okay? You're going to go ahead and mouse over to analyze, and you're gonna hit measure. When you hit measure, a new dialog box will come up and it's gonna give you some information. The information we care about is length, and so that would be what I report, 1093, which is how many pixels across it measured, okay? Obviously, this doesn't tell you anything in terms of actual units of measurement, right? Micrometers or anything. To get that information, you would have to take a separate image, 
And in the little box that we have here, and I'll have you guys taking an image of this later, there's this little slide looking box and inside of it is actually a slide that has at its center a little ruler. That ruler is what you're gonna take a picture of and then you're gonna measure how many pixels across is a micro micrometer, okay? And that's what you'll use as your reference when you present your data later. For today, it doesn't really matter, but just for your information later on, that'll be really important, okay? So this guy is over a thousand pixels across and that information, if I was going to be measuring or if I was going to be documenting it, that's what I would write down in my notebook. Okay. Let's say that instead of measuring a straight line, you wanted to measure the this whole area, this whole antenna looking thing. You could choose a different shape. So in this case, I chose an oval. Okay, so I am adjusting this oval to get as much of this little antenna as possible. It's not going to be perfect, right? Because it's a set shape. So let's say I decided this was good enough. Again, I'd have to be consistent every time and measure it this way. Again, once you have it, once you've selected your area, you hit measure and you'll get more information. And this time you'll get um, area. Um, I know that there is a way to do freehand. So let's say I wanted to be um, really precise and I wanted to trace. That's when you would use the freehand. And this takes a lot of practice. So you freehand it and then once you finish making your closed shape, you let go and then you can measure it there. That'll give you the area. So, like I said, it's not the most sophisticated tool, but it'll get the job done for whatever it is you need to do. Now, in your worksheet, you'll notice that you're going to take the practice images that are on Blackboard, and you're going to measure the length, the eye diameter, and the area of the eye using image J. Okay? Now, there's not enough microscopes for everybody to be on the microscopes at the same time. So some of you will be practicing taking images first, uh, and some of you will be doing practicing image analysis. Okay, so I'm going to put sort of a little schedule on the board for here to the end of class time. And you can start with whichever makes the most sense to you. Maybe we go in... We have three cameras, so we can go three at a time. So group one will go from 11.30, what time is the class? So 12.45. 12.45, okay. So. 11.30 to 12 will be group one, 